I'm here and I'm on. Very good. Good. <clears throat> oh, hey, I got to show you my tie. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> Karen works at the Williams. Well, <clears throat> well, 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 what this is, Karen works at the Williams Company and then it, I don't know what the hotel's called now. The AME Zion Methodist Church was having an annual conference or a regional conference. <clears throat> and so they were all in there having their meetings and, and uh, they do more preaching and singing and, and all than we do at our annual conference. But <laughs> out front in the lobby were these men with tables of really nice shoes and really nice suits, and really nice ties. And she said, you better come down here and look at these. Well, I don't know if you've seen, <clears throat> within the black community, uh, the ones who are educated and want to do well, they like to dress well. I mean, the ladies really dress sharp. I've done a, three or four black funerals, and so... They really dress nice. And the men and the black pastors, they want to look sharp. Well, anyway, Karen saw all these things, and she thought, now you've got to go over there and check out the shoes because <clears throat> if you look closely, you always see my shoes are old. They, <clears throat> they've, been, they've been resold, and they're... <clears throat> well, I did get one pair that's kind of dark brown when I wear a brown so I'll show those to you someday. <laughs> but anyway, then the, but then they had the ties, and she thought, oh, you've got to get this tie. Well, purple for Advent, and but but look at that; it's kind of quilted, or and then and and then it's and rhinestones. I hadn't either, and and I thought, you know, that's just a little too snazzy for me, but. But Karen's been after me. It's Advent. You need to be wearing your purple tie we got you. So so I went ahead and I, I got it. But it's... But it's <clears throat> well, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So... Anyway, well, have I had a wild and crazy week? I'll have to tell you, as folks kind of are gathering, as why I'm going to do what I'm doing now. <clears throat> About two months ago, I look, and in our shower, I noticed that the tile, it's been loose, but one of the tile had popped out like that so the water running down would run into the wall so I thought I'm going to fix that before we have a lot of water in the wall I push it <laughs> and four or five of those tiles fell out now I had known that we needed to fix that but Karen wanted to remodel the master bath so why spend money doing just that when we're going to redo the whole thing so anyway about two months ago it forced us to have to do something and uh, one of the reasons I'm everything so cluttered around is I will save something thinking I can use that sometime 
And as soon as I clean up and throw things away, then I have a need for something I threw away. But, you know those ceiling tiles with the fluorescence in them with the plastic? Well, I had one of those that was good when we used to, before we remodeled the kitchen and took that out. But I knew where it was. So I went, I got it, I got a caulking gun, and I went, and I just stuck that on the wall, and it covered up where the tile had fallen out, so was, we're good to go. <clears throat> but Karen said, we're not going to live like that. <laughs> so we started a process of getting estimates and deciding what she wanted, and, and because she was so particular and wanted to check prices and all of that, it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And this last week, everything came together, and we had the countertop folks coming to install. We had the plumber coming uh, to change some plumbing around, and then we had the electrician to come to get the lighting right and the exhaust fan, which we didn't have before. Anyway, all that was happening this week. And I had some deaths. I had two funerals on Saturday, I mean two funerals on Friday, and one on Saturday. And so I was very busy. And I've got to preach tonight, getting ready for that. So you remember I said I had a paper on this passage that we were doing, and I hadn't had time to reread it? I reread it, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. So I'm going to get as far as I can go with that because I didn't have the six or seven hours I usually spend each week to do my research and prepare. So, just to remind us where we were, now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien, for the famine was severe in the land. And when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. And when Abram entered Egypt, and the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful, When the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for the sake, and for her sake, he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. He got very wealthy. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai. Abram's wife. So the Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and be gone. And the Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him, and they set him on the way with his wife and all that he had. So, as we deal with the analysis of this text, in the reading of this, I'll be using Abraham instead of Abram and Sarai, Abraham and Sarah, and uh, that uh, the Yahwist had not been so much concerned with the psychological disposition of the characters, so we didn't hear what they thought and felt as far as dialoguing um, back and forth and, and a lot of reading into that, but uh, those are the things that we can extrapolate uh, with sermons, uh, kind of filling in the gaps there. But uh, to begin, I uh, in the paper, chapter 2, <laughs> the textual concerns. Now, textual concerns is, to, is a question of whether the text was somehow corrupted and... Uh, through later translations and additions that uh, out of all the little fragments of ancient manuscripts that with this particular passage there may not be very many copies or examples. And among those we know they copied from each other. They didn't have a printing press and print millions of them. Each one they had was copied from something else and in the copying a lot of times the copiers went to sleep or 
they thought someone else had made a mistake in the previous copy, and now they have to correct that mistake, or uh, think, I know better than anybody else. God is inspiring me to fix this, and so they make changes. But then when you look at all of the of ones that we have, they're all different. And then the textual criticism is a process of figuring out which one is most accurate or most historical. Uh, so that's the textual criticism. And in my research, I didn't find any big issues there because <clears throat> sometimes they say uh, it's a mess. It could be this or it could be that or it could be something else, and we have no clue which way it is. So um, with this one, there's not that problem. Um, the Genesis 20, uh, 12, uh, 10 to 20 is a separate unit that is inserted the Yahweh has inserted uh, this Egyptian interlude into the older narrative, and we can see the seams between 12.8 and 12.9, and then later in 12.20 and 13.1, uh, where he kind of, it ends here, and if you just dropped it out and stuck it back together, it would flow nicely. And so we can see that that's a place where something's been dropped in. <clears throat> so... Anyway, the redactional verses 12, 9, and 13, 1, 3, and 4 have Abraham depart from the Negev, and then he returns to the Negev before picking up the older storyline of what happens to be Abraham Lot cycles. We'll get to those next. But this one doesn't have Lot in it at all. But the ones that follow, we have a lot of issues with Lot. Lot... Uh, doesn't seem to even be known to this text, so the Yahweh slips him back in at 13.1. And uh, one of the scholars, Martin Noth, in OTH, states, The Yahweh apparently moved the story of Genesis 12.10 to 20, which stemmed from the circle of the older Abraham narratives set in the Negev to a prior position, probably in order to account for the wealth of Abraham. Now here's an interpretive uh, thought of this scholar, why did he do that? Why did the Yahweh put that one in there? What was his purpose? And he thinks the purpose was to explain how come Abraham was so wealthy. So anyway, in doing so, however, he simultaneously interrupted the formerly smooth connections which uh, had been given to him by another tradition. He had one tradition and then he picked this one up and, and sandwiched it in there. Again, in a footnote, Noth, with striking proc prolixity, Jay has made the fact of this interruption especially clear in Genesis 13, 3, and 4 by having Abraham ex return exactly to the same place that he had been in Genesis 12, 8. Now, the next chapter 3, the literary source criticism. Uh, in the foggy land, here's my style of writing when I was in seminary. This was, uh, oh gosh, where did, I figured out when this paper was probably written, uh, about 1978 or 79, when I was working on my uh, D-men. How many years ago was that? <laughs> anyway, in the foggy land between the most obvious form critical sources and the extant literary sources, it is quite difficult for the present writer, me, to conjecture with much certainty as to where to draw the line. When a narrative was cut loose from its cultic, etiological, and ethnological origins and is adrift in the oral narrative form, at what point does it enter into literary written form in some no longer extant source upon which our present text may have been based? In other words... <clears throat> There's a piece of the history, and it's being passed along orally, but at some point it gets written, and then to try to figure out when was it only oral, and then when did it become written, when we don't have the text that was written that this author used to write what we have now. So it's really hard to... Uh, find that time of its origin in an oral form and then when it became literary and then did it change. And one of the problems with these ancient texts is even when it's written down, the oral tradition continues. 
So those kind of take a life of their own, and the written can take a life of its own, and sometimes they meet up again. And uh, anyway, it's uh, for the scholar, it's really difficult. <clears throat> so that's what I'm explaining there. Now, the literature, our story in Genesis is not unique. It is one of a type. We find the parallels in Genesis uh, 21 to 18. And just so you'll know what we're talking about, I will uh, just get over there and let's just read this so you can see what we are dealing with. Okay, from there, Abraham journeyed toward the region of the Negeb, back to the Negeb, and settled between Kadesh and Shur. While residing in Gerar, Gerar as an alien, Abraham said of his wife Sarah, She's my sister. And King Abimelech of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, You are about to die because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not approached her. Remember the question I raised about the Pharaoh, were the plagues to protect Sarah from being violated, or was it punishment after the fact? But anyway, in this, this story kind of clarifies that no, she wasn't violated. <clears throat> now, Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. Now we've got Sarah in on the, on the deception in this story. I did this in the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands. And then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. Furthermore, it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, <clears throat> return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, and you and all that are yours. And so Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? <clears throat> How have I sinned against you that you have brought such great guilt on me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that ought not to have been done. And here again we have that theme. Abraham was supposed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. And here he's not living up to that charge. Anyway, Abimelech said to Abraham, what were you thinking of? What <clears throat> uh, that you did this thing? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me because of my wife, because she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he's my brother. And then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife, Sarah, to him. Abimelech said, my land is before you. Settle where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, look, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is your exoneration before all who are with you. You are completely vindicated. And then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and also healed his wife and female slaves so that they bore children. <clears throat> now, we didn't have him being sick, but God had come to him in a dream, so we've got a, a little cross-fertilization there. But anyway, of the, of the stories, For the Lord had closed fast the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So it kind of worked in a a little bit of a of a curse there <clears throat> and then 26 6 to 16 is the th third one so that you will kind of know what I'm talking about when we get to those comparisons so Isaac settled in Gerar when the men of that place asked him about his wife he said she is my sister 
for he was afraid to say, My wife, thinking, or else the men of that place might kill me for the sake of Rebekah, because she is attractive in appearance. When Isaac had been there for a long time, King Abimelech of the Philistines looked out of his window and saw him fondling his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech called for Isaac and said, So she is your wife. Why then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I thought I might die because of her. And Abimelech said, What is this that you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. Now here we've got <clears throat> Abimelech and his people have high moral standards by this interchange. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall be put to death. So Isaac sowed seed in the land, and in the same year reaped a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich. He prospered more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and great household, so the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines has stopped up and filled with earth all the wells that his father and servants had dug in the days of his father Abraham. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us. You have become too powerful for us. <clears throat> Interesting parallels. <clears throat> but anyway... Um, and besides those, there are several legends and stories with the same basic core to be found still existing in uh, literature outside the Bible, the Jewish Haggadah and Midrash and the Targums, as well as there's a Genesis Apocryphon that provides such examples. <clears throat> I won't read those to you because I don't have them anymore. <laughs> but anyway, they're in the library where I was researching. Anyway, since I found no one to argue the possibility that Genesis 12, 10 to 20 was a com composition of the Yahwist, I shall assume that it is a piece of different tradition from the material which surrounds it. I also assume that it is generally agreed that there is a high probability of these several traditions, written and oral, which uh, our various uh, redactors used as their sources for these I put forth the possibility that these traditions came into contact with one another at various times rather than there being a purely linear chronological uh, <clears throat> form of transmission. One was, in other words, one was written and then the next one borrowed it and wrote a new story and then the third one had both of them and then wrote that way, but rather that they are kind of floating around, bumping into each other and picking up... Uh, different aspects as people were hearing the stories over and over again in the oral tradition. Um, anyway, since different scholars argue for the originality of various versions of the story, and since it is difficult to see which way the influence may have run, I contend that they may have had lots of cross-pollinating. So anyway, that was my thought then, and still think there's high probability that's the case. Martin Noth presents the most convincing argument for the original story of the threat to the ancestress. That's kind of the theme that, uh, that this took up, the threat to the ancestress. He picks Genesis 26, and here's his argument. This story, as distinct from the two variants in the corresponding Abraham story, uh, appears here in a still completely profane form. God is really not a big actor in this story, uh, in other words. Moreover, in the manner in which it lets the true situation of the marriage relationship between Isaac and his wife be discovered, it is drastically blunt in comparison to the Abraham stories. It may be that here we find ourselves relatively close to the original form of this frequently utilized narrative material. And then just to add, when we get there, it may be part of, you know, a real story. I mean, something happened very much like this, and it got gathered up and told over and over and over again, but then took a life of its own. But anyway... Though we must notice that in Genesis 26, this form is apparently present in a condensed literary formulation, at least at the opening. The original meaning of this material then most likely should be derived from Genesis 26. It involves a graphic characterization in a concrete instance in a Canaanite city dwellers 
whose weakness and lack of inhibition in the face of feminine charms was manifestly experienced as strange in the circles of nomadic Israelite herdsmen. In these circles, it must have been believed that the Canaanites, in the interest of their weakness and unrestrained passion, would commit a treacherous murder to avoid incurring the objective guilt of a patent act of adultery, a thing they also feared. Now, that was uh, the Martin Noth's reasoning. In a footnote, Noth also adds, the enhancement of the danger for the wife was added in the later variants as background for the wonderful divine intervention. Now, if this be the case, then the source for that part of the story, wherein the patriarch passes his wife off as sister, probably originated in the Isaac tradition. Its transfer to Abraham, the patriarch favored by the later tradition, then becomes secondary. The variant of our story in Genesis 21 to 18 and in the Genesis Apocryphon Uh, show later developments, especially the more sensitive moral concern as well as the evidence of elaborations indicate there being later compositions. In other words, things are added to them uh, and dealing with the moral things, trying to clear things up, that aspect. No, Abimelech and Pharaoh did not touch her, and she was not violated to try to keep the ancestress pure. Anyway, I feel that the threat to the ancestress came from the Isaac tradition, but that the famine motif comes from the Abraham tradition, and particularly from our text itself, which is, introduces it into the story. And then I explain a little later about more about that. But first, the Isaac story uh, in Genesis 26 need not know anything of a famine. Verses 26, 1 to 6, develop the famine and the promise themes, which could very well be some of this cross-pollinization I mentioned. But in regard to the famine motif, I believe that the Moses Exodus story must enter into our consideration of a literary source. That Mos- I mentioned that before. This is very similar. Going down to Egypt, there's Pharaoh, and I mean, there's just so many similarities. But it is possible that it is here that We can account for the elements of the famine and a flight into Egypt, the character of the Pharaoh, the plagues, the expulsion, uh, military escort or pursuit at the the end of the story. Uh, But anyway, I'd made a little chart, and if I had had time, I would have run some of these off. But to, uh, to make the comparison, anyway, we've got a famine drives Abraham into Egypt. And a famine drives the sons of Israel into Egypt. Then Pharaoh takes by force the ancestress, presses her into service to serve him and his needs. The Pharaoh takes by force the people of Israel and presses them into service to take care of his and his people's needs. Then Abraham receives wealth. That comes first. And then uh, Yahweh inflicts plagues on Pharaoh. Uh, in, in the Moses story, Yahweh inflicts plagues on the Pharaoh, and then Israel receives or takes wealth as they're leaving. But the Pharaoh lets the ancestress leave with wealth, and then the Pharaoh lets the Israelites leave with wealth, and then the ancestress is giving a, given a military escort to the border. And then the El, uh, Israelites are given a military pursuit to the border. So these pieces, you know, follow along. They are manipulated somewhat differently. But in hearing the story go that way, then uh, we, we see uh, the common bonds in them. Anyway, the details of the wife's sister motif are pushed into the background by the influence of the Moses Exodus tradition in that story. Abimelech in Gerar becomes Pharaoh in Egypt, and this shift may have occurred early. 
and had been unique to the Abraham Negev traditions, or maybe quite late. It fits well into the Yahwist's charisma, his message and thesis that Hans Walter Wolf states that one might make the case for the Moses Exodus connection being a Yahwist redaction. In other words, the Yahwist writer really added that into this story. He had a basic story, but he's the one who kind of put it there in order to make his theological and thematic lessons to the children of Israel. Anyway, but I had, I'm not quite qualified to do anything more than to kind of toss that idea up into the air and hope that it might fly by itself. But anyway, the possible theological significance of Moses' Exodus connection we come to later in this paper. Now, oral form criticism. Um, Lang Martin Noss theory aside, uh, we find several other speculations on the possible origin of the story in our text. We are led back to the tribal, the etiological, and that's the how did things come to be? You know, who dug that well? How come the fox has a white tip on his tail? These legendary uh, stories, uh, the kind of, or anyway, ethnological stories and narratives, you know, where did our people come from? Uh, As an early legend, the story may have simply been told around the campfire, extolling the magnificent beauty of the ancestress and the wisdom uh, of the ancestor who knew how to extricate himself so successfully from a precarious situation with the help of God and also to uh, come out wealthy. But either uh, with a separate and distinct origin or as later addition to the Proceeding conjecture is the possibility of our text having roots in the tribal etiology. You know, who are we? Where do we come from? The substance of which is, how did we come to be so prosperous? And another possible etiological source, particularly related to the wife-sister motif concerning for establishing the purity of the bloodline, as I mentioned before, or the possibility of establishing the principle for the tribal endogamy, and endogamy is that word uh, like polygamy, uh, where you marry within the tribe. I mentioned that last week, that some go away, marry outside the tribe, but then there are some who, particularly upper classes, they have a sense of we are pure. It's like royalty, have got to go marry other royalty, can't marry commoners. we got to have the line pure. So that's endogamy. Uh, if any or all of these possibilities be the case, the original details, which have surely been dropped or supplanted by others along the way, are unrecoverable. But our text stands now in the canon. It serves entirely a different function than the earlier sources of the story. In other words, the Yahwist has a theology and a message to the people. And so he's trying to make that come out by the way he tells the story and to make the connections sort of uh, between Abraham and Moses. Uh, Anyway, form critical methods uh, do help explain from where the particular elements within our story may have come. Uh, Anyway, this information is helpful for us to uh, figure out what was the original meaning. Why were they writing this? Why was it preserved? What, What was in that story that spoke to the following generations. Uh, It reminded them of who they are. It's kind of like George Washington and chopping down the cherry tree with his little hatchet and I cannot tell a lie. You know, it's a story, probably not true, but it's saying that the father of our country was an honest person. He had integrity since he was a little boy. He was a good person. So the stories, you know, we're trying to make a point. Uh, Anyway, earlier, the the story in our text has probably been transferred out of its original context within the Isaac narrative over into the Abraham narratives and then later linked to the Moses Exodus story. Therefore, that's why it stands in our text the way it is now. And therefore, it's probably not historically accurate as a detailed account of what actually happened. But there are 
different parts of this story, sort of like a <clears throat> uh, historical novel that may have a character who is not a real historical person, but the setting and what happened and the attitudes and the dynamics of the time are very accurate and give us a sense of of what was really going on at that time. So these stories have that element. But in our story, the famine is not ever suggested to be caused by Yahweh. So the famine is not a punishment for something. It just is. It's a fact of life. And the Yahwist uh, knows that the famines come again and again and again in their history uh, in that part of the Palestine and that it's the, the southern region that's closest to the more, more fruitful uh, Egypt. Now, the climate, which is basically the same today as in the Old Testament times, is susceptible to drought, and then when there's drought, then there's famine. And rainfall is seasonal. Even uh, then, it only comes in cloud bursts, sort of like we have it here. When we need a good rain, we get this big thunderstorm, and it comes down heavy and hard, and it washes away, and it doesn't soak in when we have those gentle rains when it rains all day and, and you know, it just is allowed to soak in. And that's, that's wonderful for our, our yard and our gardens and so forth. But since the vegetation needs the moisture and then the cattle and the sheep, the small cattle, uh, depend upon the seasonal rainfall to grow the grass, when that doesn't happen, then the herdsmen have a choice of either starve and stay where you are or migrate uh, somewhere else. For uh, the extra-biblical sources, we find evidence that such occurrences happened often. There's a report from an Egyptian frontier official sent to his superior, to the scribe of the treasury, concerning an Edomite uh, shepherds to whom permission was given to cross into Egypt for seasonal pasturing of the flocks in the delta. And it reads, quote, We have finished letting the Bedouin tribes of Edom pass the fortress to keep them alive and to keep their cattle alive. End quote. So this is a little piece of document, not in our Bible, but uh, that, that has been found from that general time period showing that this happens. Uh, these migrations because of famines. So famines and migrations are historical, uh, and it's historically credible that Abraham, as well, may have gone down into Egypt at some time or another. I mean, it's possible that that could have happened. And uh, so the patriarchs live there, and they experience those kind of conditions. And we know they had sheep and goats, and so it's... That part uh, is highly probable that they did have the migrations, but the actual story as it is um, probably didn't happen exactly that way. Anyway, it is generally agreed today that the patriarchs were real people who possibly lived in the second millennium, although some may have it as early as the third millennium before the common era. But the current scholarship holds uh, that there is a link if only a thin thread between historical events and the narratives as they stand uh, today. But in the case of our text, the event is probably not related to that patriarch or that particular time. Now there's Sarah. have to deal with Sarah. What do we know about Sarah? Well, there's evidence of or there's not any evidence of a separate Sarah tradition, stories about Sarah, like we have of Abraham, of Isaac, Abraham and Lot, Abraham and the Negev, and so forth. Sarah's not mentioned apart from her relationship with Abraham, and this is introduced to us uh, in Genesis 11, 29, 30, as Abraham's barren wife. Her importance in the narrative is as wife to Abraham and mother to Isaac, through the special blessing of Yahweh after the time that she would no longer be able to bear children. However, if the three great patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, represent 
three unrelated persons who later tradition kind of brought together by creating a genealogical link, then it is possible that the character of Sarah was invented to provide this link. Nevertheless, even if this be the case, if Abraham is historically real, then his wife was probably named Sarah or Sarai. Anyway, those are little ideas that scholars can kick around, and if uh, if you come up with a new and shocking idea, then people are going to read about it and argue about it and write back to you and say, you fool, you got it all wrong, and then you get these arguments going back and forth in the uh, in the scholarly journals. But anyway, um, that's, uh, that's what often happens uh, in scholarship. There's a generally held belief that the majority of people understand and accept, and if you want to make a name for yourself, you go out and challenge one of those. And sometimes you can get big corporations to pay you a lot of money if your challenge happens to be supporting their agenda. Uh, over and against the generally uh, held uh, science. But anyway, sort of like tobacco won't kill you. We had scientists being paid by the tobacco industry to promote articles that no, 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 that's not happening. Anyway, the wife-sister motif is an indisputable aspect of the endangered ancestress story. Now, And I brought up a lot of this last week, Um, but anyway, if we follow the Eloist of uh, chapter 20, Sarah was Abraham's half-sister by virtue of being Terah's daughter by another woman other than Abraham's wife. And I think it's only here that we get that. It's not, you know, brought out uh, anywhere else. So we think that was put there to help us... uh, make Abraham not uh, be so low a character, uh, but that he was telling the truth. He wasn't making it up is what this is trying to show. Um, anyway, if uh, Abraham and Sarah had the legal relationship, such as reflected in the Newsy tablets I mentioned last week, uh, then there is significance to that custom. Now, the Newsy tablets provide uh, another possible answer to the wife-sister motif, and it is historical a custom of juridical rather than blood relationships. In ancient Nuzi archives of the Hurrian Society, there were these legal documents. And I mentioned A.E. Spicer last week. He worked really hard on developing the research and coming up with this, uh, that the wife-sister relationship uh, did exist. And, um, and since the Israelites lived close to the Hurrian culture and society. It's easy for them to have picked some of this stuff up. Um, But um, there's another guy, uh, Samuel Greengus, who argues against the newsy sister-wife motif in Genesis on the grounds that rather than conferring special status and privilege to women of the top levels of society, as Spicer argued, the practice of adopting women as sisters is instead a means of manumitting or freeing slave girls. He writes, the adopted sister was originally a freed slave girl. We see her low origins reflected in the clause which states that the party giving her away in sisterhood be required to clear her title should a claim against her arise. Buy and sell. We got realtors in here. Buy and sell houses. You have to clear the title so that someone won't come back and say, that's my house. You have no right to it. It was stolen from me. Well, this is the same clearing the title of the slave girl that someone can't claim her as slave. So this type of guarantee is typically exacted when selling a parcel of real estate or a slave or cattle or other property. You didn't rustle those cattle. You own them. You have clear title. Uh, And it is never associated with transactions involving persons of free, not to speak of, not to mention noble status. So that's another scholar who, like I said, 
generally held idea. Someone works hard, said, no, you got it wrong. Here's a better idea. So uh, anyway, we're speculating on uh, receiving a, a bride price, as it were, that Abraham, using this wife-sister motif, uh, and that the Pharaoh makes him rich, is kind of like paying a bride price or and it gets it could get even lower had her working as a prostitute and he is like a pimp he gets rich uh, because pharaoh's rich and he he wants that girl but anyway because of the low status of these adoptive sisters he rejects the possibility there being any connection with the biblical ancestress of being a possibility his arguments are convincing only as far as the elevated status of biblical ancestress are concerned. He does not disapprove the remote possibility of the historical remembrance, foggy though it may be, the mention of the wife-sister motif in the Genesis narratives. It adds up to a possibility uh, that, you know, a lot of this stuff could be going on. Uh, Martin Noss contention that the Isaiah Rebecca episode is the account nearest the original story, and it gives that strongest evidence of the Hurrian fratri- uh, fratri- matriarchal, fratriarchal uh, structure and customs and the endogamy uh, process. Anyway, therefore, I conclude the historic- historicity of the wife-sister motif is inconsequential to our narrative in Genesis 12. It's only a ploy to protect Abraham's neck. Pharaoh, and then about the Pharaoh... Someone asked last time about which Pharaoh might that have been. And the answer, I can't remember what I said a few weeks ago, but anyway, uh, we cannot be certain of which millennium Abram was in, much less the century, and therefore to pinpoint what Pharaoh it might have been and that it might not have even been Pharaoh, it might have been Abimelech, if, if it might have been, and then it might not have been Abraham at all, it could be Isaac. So um, anyway, we, we don't know about the Pharaoh. And then, um, but anyway, if, the, but the reality is, if one went down into that territory, the Pharaoh was all-powerful. Pharaoh was understood to be divine and divine right of kings. They, everything in their domain uh, is theirs to their taking, their control. And so uh, it would, anybody would be dangerous, uh, in a dangerous position. Even if you were a citizen of the country, much less an immigrant, um, you know, the, one of the phrases in our uh, prophetic literature over and over again of the righteousness and justice of God was the concern for the orphan and the widow and the stranger in the land. These were powerless people in the culture, uh, just at risk against anybody who was established, but mostly uh, the king or whoever had the most power, the widow and the orphan and the stranger in the land had the least power. And so it's a very precarious uh, position to have to be an immigrant somewhere. So um, those, oh, and the fact that uh, the word uh, for Pharaoh was great house, and so if he took Sarah into his house, he uh, taking possession of her. Well, my gosh, I'm only on page 16. I thought I would use all this time up. Um, well, I tell you what, I will work through this and pick out some of the highlights before we get off to going off into the Negev and have Abraham and Lot with all their wealth uh, and their herders getting into fights with each other and deciding how are we going to solve this problem. Okay, we got five minutes. Any questions or any insights, any arguments, a different theory? Three is enough. <laughs> three's, oh, three, oh, yeah, the three different stories. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons, you know, it would it'd be maybe more fun to uh, 
just read a text and then just forget it, and then I can tell you all kinds of stories about remodeling the bathroom and <laughs> and uh, buying interesting ties with with little what do we call these rhinestones, rhinestones uh, on it, but uh, diamonds, yes, they could be. It's within the realm of possibility. I mean, it could have been Abimelech or it could have been Pharaoh. It could be diamond. It could be rhinestone. Uh, There are all kinds of things. Um, Yes. I can't remember. I think I did. Hmm? Oh, yeah. You weren't in yet. The story was the AME Zion Methodist church was having a regional or an annual conference over at the uh, hotel across from the Williams and Karen was over there and saw that going on and they they had some salesmen out in front while the people were singing and shouting and preaching and amening and all on the inside when they had a break they had these really nice shoes and really sharp suits and nice ties and Karen thought you ought to come look at those. And I got a pair of shoes, and I got this tie. But it's a little too fancy normally, but it's Advent, and it's purple. Look look how they made that. That's got a... Wow. Look at that. I mean, oh it's, it's... It's... Well, that's really in. The bedazzled look. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I'll... Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm I'm ready to go, but... <laughs> yes, yes. I decided I've I've got to get got to. I I was listening to TED Talk on the radio as I was coming home after the my, TED Talk. They have people who are really inspirational and and really they they talk. They're 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 neat people. And um, and one of them was a young woman who was in an accident, and they told her that she would uh, she had lost two points in her intellect because of the head trauma and she could never go back to college and finish but she did and she uh, worked really hard and she got to this one point of where she was going to have to uh, uh, give a talk in class just 20 minutes to only 20 people and she was so terrified and she said in her heart she thought that she was a fake she was not who she was trying to be, that she had this brain damage and she couldn't, wasn't ever supposed to graduate from college. And she told her teacher, I can't do it. And the teacher said, you can do it. You imagine yourself, imagine yourself of how you will be and how you can be and fake it, fake it. John Wesley had the same thing, preach faith until you have it. You don't have to be perfect to start, but you can grow into it. And anyway, she, she's been real popular, and she succeeded, but not only graduating there, she went on to Northwestern, she went to Harvard, and now she's a professor with a PhD herself. When they told her with the brain damage, she couldn't even graduate. But she had this image. She believed in herself. So a part of it is fake it till you make it <laughs> was the theme, and you can become. So a part of it is dress the part. Dress the part. And so I'm going to dress the part. Dress the part. So, and then there was another TED Talk. It's very interesting. I've got to find it. It was about a guy who had... Uh, uh, Vietnamese heritage, his family had to leave and barely got out, and he told a story. Gosh, this is, this is fascinating. He was just a little kid. They were supposed to get on the bus to leave, and he, for some reason, he had a meltdown, and he was crying, and, and, and the family said, okay, we won't get on the bus. We'll take the next bus. That bus filled up, went down the road. A rocket came. <laughs> rocket. Everybody died on that bus. And if he hadn't had his little meltdown as a kid, he and his whole family would have been dead. 
But he said, in their culture and their language, they do not have the subjective case in, in language, which is the woulda, would, could, ought, might. Everything just is. And, and he said, within that, it creates us a lot of guilt. If, oh gosh, if only. But without, it might be. It could be. In the English language, we have this ability to have vision and possibilities and to strive for them instead of just, it is what it is. Take it as it comes. But no, you don't have to take it as it comes. You can plan and prepare and you can work hard and you can find a different way just because we've got the subjunctive case in our language. Anyway, that was another interesting talk. NPR, wonderful, informative stuff. Bobby used to listen to NPR 